gone just so early on Sunday morning, isn't it? Yeah. Love it. Love it. I am glad to see your shining, smiling faces here today. It just brings joy to me. It's so funny because I'm sitting back here and that song that we started off today, right? And like half the people are like, it's so early. It's early for this, right? Anyway, my name is Tim Bycroft. I am so glad you guys are with us today. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here uh, at the Point Church. Point Church, if you've been around for a while, you know this. Say it with me, if you will. The Point Church exists to welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. This is why we exist. This is why we do the things that we do. If you ever want to know why we do it, this is why we do it. To welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Um, we do this by pointing people to God. We do this by pointing people to Jesus. We do this by pointing people to community, which is the church, where we learn to and help each other to be equipped, okay, and encouraged in our journey with Jesus Christ. So we're glad that you guys are here. Uh, this is week two of a series that we started last week, um, simply entitled, Great Lessons from the Lesser Knowns. Um, today, the sermon title is, This Doesn't Make Any Sense. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Um, or this makes no sense. And let me, just, let me just say a couple of things, because I think we would all agree that there are things in this life that when you look at them, they really don't make any sense. Such as, let me just throw a couple things out. Have you noticed that when you go to the ATM, the drive through ATM, the letters are in Braille? <laughs> you ever watch those war movies and the kamikaze pilots have helmets? <laughs> Why is there an expiration date on sour cream? Why are boxing rings square? <laughs> Makes no sense. Some of you are going to wake up later and go, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up around women. And what I mean by that is I grew up in a household that had, I had my mom. I had two older sisters. Okay. I was a baby of the family. So I've always had women around me. I've been married for 30 years. Plus years to the most amazing woman in the world, Mindy. Yeah. You're all clapping because you're like, she put up with you for 30 some years. You're like, I have three daughters, and so I've been around women a lot in my life, and this is what I know. You don't make sense. All right? Men have to admit this. Okay? You don't make sense. And why is that? I'm just going to point out one thing. And, and y'all guys would agree with me, and I've been around women all my life, so I've seen this, and this is a truth. Why is it that when women put on mascara, their mouth opens just wide up? I mean, you can put all of your other facial goodies on that make you look gorgeous, mouth shut. As soon as you head to your eye with the little eye liney thingy, fresh, your mouth falls open. I mean, it's just, I saw this in a car the other day. Some lady was at the stoplight. She's putting on her makeup, and all of a sudden, she gets her little thingy out and heads for the eye. And <laughs> Things just don't make sense. And, and if there is a guy in here... Okay, if there is a guy in here that says, I get women, I understand them perfectly, he's a liar. <laughs> he's just trying to get points, you know. He's a liar. Which is ironic. And the reason I bring this up is today, we're going to talk about a woman, an incredible woman, that I think we can all learn a lot from. 
even guys, okay? There's a lot of difficulties in this lady's life. She's been through it all, just so many things, okay? But I think that what she went through and the life story that she has offers us a lot of great lessons that we can apply to our lives, okay? And she, again, she goes through some difficulties, some hardships, some obstacles, some problems. But isn't that just life? We'll just call them storms, right? Difficulties, obstacles, trials, different kinds of suffering that we go through, the storms of life. And what's true about storms is this, that there are some of you who are in storms right now, right? There's others of you who just got out of storms. And maybe life's doing pretty well right now. But I will tell you this, you're either coming out of a storm, you're in a storm, or hang on, you're about to go into, into one. That's how life, it just works that way. Okay? And here's why. Here's, here's why we go through storms in life. The first one, and I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into much detail on this. I will probably talk about this again. Today's not the day to talk about the why so much. I'll just briefly mention that there's three main reasons why we go through storms. Obstacles, hardships. And the number one thing is me. You know, we do it to ourselves. Amen. Whether it's something that we did that was just completely stupid, said something, did something, actions that were just completely stupid, disobedience on my part, could be a sin, a reoccurring sin that takes place, and then I fall into the consequences, or we fall into the consequences of what we've done to ourselves, and we find ourselves in a storm. The other thing is, we have someone who hates us. His name is Satan, and he'll do anything to hurt God, and the best way to hurt God is to try to hurt what God loves the most, and who does he love the most? Humanity, you, me, so he's here to kill, destroy harm to the best of his ability the ones that God loves. And so he's constantly coming after us. And so many times we find ourselves in a storm is because of what evil Satan is doing in our lives. The last thing that I want to talk about, because I think this is really where we find this lady that we're going to talk about today, is the consequences of the storms we find ourselves in because of what somebody else has done to us. And sometimes that's the hardest thing for us to go through, isn't it? You know that you're carrying the consequences, you're carrying the scars, you're carrying the baggage, you're carrying the weight because of the decisions of somebody else. And it's difficult. It's tough to take. And yet, I'm going to guess that all of us experience that to some level or another. The Apostle Paul understood this and tried to encourage us when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, look, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We're, we're knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Those are encouraging words from the Apostle Paul. This verse, I want, I want you to just hold on to that verse. I want that to be kind of the foundation that drives where we're going today uh, when we talk about this amazing lady. Today we're going to talk about a lady who, now let's admit, she had her own share of mistakes. We all do, right? She had her own share of mistakes. But the bulk, bulk of the scars, the obstacles, the storms that she found herself in were caused or were the results of someone else's life situation, someone else's decision. Young lady we're going to talk about today, this amazing young lady, is the name of Hagar. Hagar. Um, here's one thing, and before we jump into her story, there's just a couple of things that I think we need to like put out as disclaimers before we jump in. It's going to help us understand kind of how God is driving her story. And the first one is this. No matter what I try to do to understand the reality of who God is, the mysteries of God, the mystery of God's ways, are beyond my comprehension. you got to start there. No matter how much you study, no matter how much you try, here's the thing. We will never fully understand or comprehend the magnificence, the supremacy of who God is. Amen. Right? 
We have to understand that he is infinite, okay, and his ways are infinite. I'm finite. You are finite, okay? That means that God has no limits. Well, let's be honest. We're very limited in the way we think, the things that we can do. There's no possible way that I can fully understand God's ways. Now, before some of you get a little upset with that, think about this for just a moment. Do you really want a God that you can fully understand, or do you want a God that so surpasses your abilities, your understanding, that that's the kind of deity that I want to follow? Amen. Right? Yes. That his ways are far superior than mine. Amen. Here's the second thing, before we get into Hagar's story, is God's loving grace, God's loving grace works out his supreme premise, or supreme purpose, God's loving grace works out his supreme purpose within and in spite of our own corrupt human nature. That's a lot to chew on. God's ultimate purpose, his supreme purpose, hear me on this, will always work out. God's supreme purpose, hear me on this, God's supreme purpose will always work out within or in spite of our own corrupt human condition. All right? That's hard to swallow sometimes because we want God to follow our own corrupt human condition. <laughs> and this happens in the world. Many times there's things that happen in the world that God doesn't condone. He doesn't originate. It's not supported. It's not endorsed by God. Okay? But what happens is our own human condition, corrupt human condition, here's what happens. There are things that happen in our world that God doesn't endorse. He doesn't condone. He didn't create. But we have made them what, just part of our culture. We accept them as our culture. In other words, just because the government says it's okay doesn't necessarily mean God endorsed it. And man, a lot of people fall into that trap real quick. Right? It's God, in spite of that, within that, and sometimes he works out um, his supremacy in, in the midst of our human condition. And that's what we're going to see in Hagar's life. Hagar's true life story, it's in Genesis. It starts in Genesis chapter 16, okay? And let me just give you a little bit of the context, okay, of what's happening in Hagar's life. This is pretty fun. we got to back up to a couple of other people to really see what's going on here. And uh, we're going to look at a couple of people by the name of Abraham and Sarah. Yes, some of you theological astute people will know that his name is Abram and Sarai right now. Give me a break. We're going to just call them Abraham and Sarah. You can read that other part of the story later. It's not really part of what we're talking about today. So Abraham and Sarah, they're actually in the Bible Faith Hall of Fame, okay? Um, they're the heroes of the faith, and they truly were. So God comes to Abraham at one point, kind of has a vision that he dumps on Abraham, and he says, hey, Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation, okay? Your descendants are going to be more plentiful and bountiful than the sands of the seas and the stars of the skies. You're going to be the father of my nations. And that's pretty cool because God is saying, hey, I'm going to work through you to create my people. Now, what makes that somewhat interesting and why this is such a big deal is that God made this promise to Abraham, who at this point is like 80 years old. Um, yeah, old. I mean, that's to be having kids, starting generations from there, descendants from there. That's, that's kind of a big deal. And at this point, Sarah is barren. She can't have children. There's nothing that shows that she can have children. So this is pretty big news, and it's good news for them. Not only are they going to have descendants, but they will be God's people. That's, is, that's big news, right? 
Millions of them. Also, one thing to keep in mind is Abraham and Sarah, I mean, they're like Warren Buffett rich. They, they've got money, lots of money. And, and here's why this is important. Because in that culture, if you had money, you also had servants. Let's call them what they are. They're slaves. Okay? So Abraham and Sarah had slaves. Let's go back to what I said before. Slavery, terrible thing. Hagar had no choice. She was a slave. She was owned to property. She was on, Sarah, Hagar was one of Sarah's slaves. I forgot to say that, sorry. But she had no choice in that. But remember what I said before, slavery, terrible thing. God doesn't endorse it. God never condones it. it, it he never originated slavery. Hear me on that. This was something that had become acceptable in that culture. And God works within it. He actually works in spite of the corrupt human nature. So we have to keep that in mind as well. This is a big deal. You know, it's part of the story. So Hagar is a slave to Abraham and Sarah. Again, Abraham and Sarah, older, no children yet. God made the promise, hey, your descendants are going to be my people. You're going to have generations and generations and generations of people. But here's the problem. About 10 years goes by. They have no babies. Now they're in their 90s. Wow. And so Sarah's thinking, apparently God's forgot. I don't know. Or maybe God needs a little help. Maybe we need to get creative with this. And so what Sarah does is she takes things into her own hands, and Sarah goes and gets her servant, her slave girl, Hagar, and she brings her back to Abraham and says, Abraham, I need you to sleep with Hagar, my little slave girl here, because she's going to be like the surrogate mother to our son. And what happens is Abram, remember what we said right up front? Men don't get women. This is one of those times where he's caught. He's like, is this a trick? Is this a test? I'm not sure what I want to do. But he says, okay, if you insist. I'm not sure this is going to be easy, but I'll do my best. This is like, have you, is anybody seeing Handmaid's Tale? Handmaid's Tale, the Handmaid's Tale, anybody seen that? If you haven't, you should, because this is the story. This, this is it. This is the story. Anyway, so sure enough, Abraham impregnates Hagar. So Hagar is with child. Now, I want you to stop and just consider for just a moment these two ladies in this story. You got Sarah. Okay? So Sarah, this was her own doing. She watches, and she has to be watching Hagar as she sees the baby growing inside of her, knows the baby is developing inside of Hagar, and she's, she's staring at Hagar, and she's seeing something that Hagar and her husband share that she'll never be able to share in. Okay? You can just feel that tension starting to rise up in her. You think about Hagar. She's a slave. I mean, she's, she's at the bottom rung of society at this point. She's picking up Sarah's laundry one day, and the next thing... She has the promise of God's descendant inside of her. That, I mean, all of a sudden, her life just changed. She goes from the bottom rung to, I've got the promise coming inside of me. She feels like it's a pretty big deal. You know, her future has just radically changed. And I don't know, I don't know if she was doing this or not, but it kind of seems like it in the scripture that she might have been walking by Sarah and going, how do you like your nap? Because this is what we know. We don't know everything that happened. We don't know everything that was said. We don't know all the looks that were given. We don't know all the conversations that took place. All we know is this, that at some point, Sarah loses it. I mean, she just snaps. She can't take it anymore. This is what scripture says. She goes to Abraham. At one point, she goes to Abraham, and she says, Abraham, this is your fault. <laughs> you know what Abraham's doing? 
He's standing there like he's putting on mascara. <laughs> really? What? What? She says, I put my servant into your arms, but now she's pregnant and she's treating me with contempt. See, the Lord's going to show us who's wrong, you or me. Verse 6, Abraham, not afraid of backing down from a good family fight here. Look, she's your servant. So deal with her as you see fit, was the result. Then Sarah treated Hagar more harshly, and so Hagar finally runs away. All right, so Hagar can't take it any longer either. Hagar is being treated so poorly by Sarah, she's just like, that's it. And, and here's the thing. You know, Sarah is so jaded by her own, hear me out. Sarah is so jaded by her own doings that she starts treating Hagar terribly, okay? And, and Hagar can't take it anymore. And so she'd rather face, Hagar rather face death as a runaway slave than stay in that relentless, just pitiful place where she's continually emotionally abused by Sarah. So she heads off to Egypt. That's where she's from, by the way. Hagar is from Egypt. And so she's going back to Egypt, and God sees all this happening. And so God sends a messenger to Hagar as she's running away from Abraham and Sarah back to Egypt. And he says, hey, what are you doing? And she's like, God, I, I just, I can't. I, can't. I just can't do this any longer. What is God's response? The angel of the Lord spoke to Hagar. He says, I need you to return to your mistress, Sarah. I need you to go back as a slave to your slave owner and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. Hagar, that child within you will also have a promise because he is Abraham's seed as well. Hagar, your son will be the father of a great nation. Go back to Sarah. Submit to her leadership. Let's pause for a second. And this is one of those times where you go, this makes no sense. I, I mean, seriously. Why would God send Hagar back into a terrible situation. Why would God send Hagar back into a situation to face Sarah, knowing that Sarah is probably going to put Hagar through terrible consequences? Why would he do that? I'm not going to answer that question, but I will say this. In the same sentence that he says, go back to Sarah, he also says this, God gave her a promise that your child, the child within you, is going to become a great nation. He gives her a great promise. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of the tragedy, in the midst of the obstacle, God gives a great promise. Abraham's seed is in you. Go back. Go back into slavery. Go back into submission. Go back into that harsh environment. But I'm giving you a great promise as you go. Hagar turned around and she goes back. And she made right, things right with Sarah. And she has her baby. And they name uh, Hagar's baby Ishmael. Now, Ishmael, this is really important, it simply means this God sees you. God sees you. That's what Ishmael means. Ishmael grows up and, and he grows up in the household of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, okay? So Abraham looks at him as his one and only son, which he truly is. Ish, hear me on this. Ishmael is truly, at this point, Abraham's one and only son through Hagar, not his wife Sarah. Abraham treats Ishmael as though God is carrying out his promise through Ishmael, through him. Thirteen years go by. This is what's running through Abraham's mind. Ishmael's the one. Ishmael's the one. 
That's probably running through Ishmael's mind. This is probably running through Hagar's mind. This is probably what's running through Sarah's mind until Sarah gets pregnant. Oh, my goodness. This is like a Hallmark movie. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the middle of the movie where it goes, dun, dun, dun. She's pregnant. Now what? Right? Now what? So Sarah gets pregnant. This is a roller coaster ride for Hagar because Hagar's like down, then up, and then back down, and then back up, and then back down, and then Sarah comes up pregnant. She's like, okay, back down again. And, and so she's just up and down, up and down. And so Sarah has this baby boy, and his name is Isaac. You guys remember Isaac? Okay. And a few years passed, and boys being boys, boys doing what boys do, Ishmael somehow or another starts making fun of Isaac, and Sarah sees it. She's mad. Mama lion, okay, protecting her cub. She says to Abraham, I want this woman and her son. I want them gone. Get rid of them. I don't care what you do, but they are out. Now put yourself in Abraham's shoes. This is his son. Ishmael is his son. Isaac is his son. Sarah is his wife. Hagar is the mother of his son, Ishmael. And he's a bit... Perplexed, to say the least. Because he's raised Ishmael as his own son, and now she's saying, Psh, be gone. But God comes to Abraham. That's what God says in Genesis chapter 21, starting verse 12. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over this boy and your servant, talking about Hagar. Do whatever Sarah tells you. And so Abraham does what Sarah says, and he sends Hagar and Ishmael out. Let me pause again and go, man, this just doesn't make sense. I mean, come on, this, this is one of those times where it just doesn't make sense. Why would God send this poor girl who none of this was her fault? She was a slave. She had no control over what other people were doing to her. She had no control. Why would God say, hey, listen to Sarah? who's wanting to do harm to Hagar and Ishmael. Remember what we said at the very beginning, God works within and in spite our corrupt human nature. So Abraham and Sarah, you see, they created the mess. Let me say that again, because sometimes we don't hear this often enough. Abraham and Sarah, they're the ones that created the mess. And God's the one who says, this is how it's going to be resolved. He doesn't just really clean up a mess, but he sends people into similar messy situations as we see it. And it looks like, wow, this just doesn't make any sense. Because, hear me on this, what Abraham knew, what Sarah knew, what Hagar knew, what Ishmael knew is this, that when he cast them out into the desert, because that's what he's getting ready to do, he's going to give them a little bit of water, a little bit of food to get them far enough away that they're going to die. This is a death sentence. And they all know it. Abraham sends them out on a march into the desert to die. And they know this. And so they walk out into the desert and sure enough, time elapsed. And they run out of water. And they're not doing well. Scriptures say that Hagar looked at Ishmael. She knows he's dying. He's done, he doesn't have long to go. And it says that Hagar takes Ishmael and she kind of props him up underneath a bush in the shade, knowing he's going to die. But you stop and you think about Hagar and everything that she's been through, the emotional turmoil, the abuse, all the different things of being a slave that you can even dream or imagine have happened to her. Um, she's been used and abused terribly. And to watch her son die is more than she can do more than she can bear at this point. And so she starts, she just leaves him there to die. She's walking away. It says, the scriptures say she gets about a hundred yards away. Ishmael, he's old enough now to know who God is. And so he starts to cry out to God. Hagar's walked away a little bit and she's crying out to God. And, and God does what 
God often does is meets us at the end <laughs> of our stick in the very moment of her desperate need God came to Hagar and, said, and says this in Genesis 21 verse 17 he goes Hagar Hagar what's wrong as if he didn't he says don't be afraid God has heard the boy crying as he lies there he says, go back to him. Go back to him and comfort him. And in this story, what you see is that God miraculously provides water. There's a well there. And, and they're able to drink and be replenished. And they're able to drink enough and save enough water to make the rest of their journey because they're heading back to Egypt one more time. And so they get rejuvenated. They take enough water to make the journey back to Egypt, and as the story goes, that's the last we hear of Hagar and Ishmael. So what can we learn? What can we learn? I want to share a couple of things here with you. When life doesn't make sense, when things don't seem like this makes any sense at all, why are these things happening? God, why are you allowing these things happening? Why are you calling me to these things? The first thing that I think we need to understand is this. Always remember God's promises. Lean into God's promises. When life doesn't make sense, remember the promises of God. There are some of you that you're in this stage, you're in this storm right now, and then the only thing that I can say, because the storm is so bad, the storm is raging right now in your life is this. Hold on to, cling to the promises of God. Because they're everlasting. Genesis 10, 16, 16, 10 says this, God came to Hagar, I will give you more descendants than you can count. That's what she needed, right? He's saying, go back, go back to Sarah. You're going to go back into slavery. You're going to go back into oppression. You're going to go back into a terrible situation. But Sarah, remember this, that the son inside of you is going to be of great descent. That, that didn't sound right. He, he, you know, he's going to have descendants of a great nation. Okay? And so there was this promise that she was, that was enough for her to be able to go back into that situation. God saw the big picture. She didn't. God gave her a promise, and that promise is all she needed. And sometimes that's the promises that we need. I, I talk about these promises all the time. I'm going to give you one today. One that I hope that you can cling on to when it says that we're hard-pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. The Apostle Paul also said this in Romans 8. He says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I mean, that's a strong promise that no matter what is happening in your life, God can turn that around and use it for his glory, his kingdom, his benefit. And isn't that why we're here? Isn't that why we do the things that we do? Sometimes just holding on to a promise. That's just one thing. How about this one? How about this one? I told you I'm not going to give you a bunch of promises, and then here I go. How about this one? In the midst of the storms where anxieties and worries are cast upon you constantly, God says, when those worries and anxieties come, come before me with prayer and petition. Lay those before me. And the God of the supernatural God of peace will overcome any of the things that you're facing. He doesn't say those things are going to go away, but he says his peace is stronger than any. That's his promise. All right, I got to keep on. Sometimes just having that promise, that's the one thing that will get you through the storm. Even when it seems like God's calling you to do something that just doesn't make sense, his promises will carry you through. Here's the second thing. Rely on God's plan. Genesis 16, 9, in Hagar's story, it says, The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, return to your owner, and submit to her authority. You know, that was probably the one thing that Hagar didn't want to hear. Go back to your slave owner. She probably didn't want to hear that. That's probably not, like, on her top ten of things to do today. 
But he says, go back. Let's be honest. Many times, the things that God calls us to don't make sense in the moment. How many of you understand that one? That God has called you to do some stuff that don't make sense in the moment. How about this? Those who hate you, pray for them. And not pray that they'll die, but actually pray for them and go with them. Okay? How about this one? Love your enemies. God says love your enemies. That, that's a mandate. And that sometimes does, that doesn't make sense, right? You know? Um, and, 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 and that even goes politically. Christians, stop putting some kind of negative adjective before you say President Biden. Or Donald Trump. Non-Christians can do that. Christians, we can't. Because it says, respect your governing authorities. That's a mandate. That's a directive. You don't get to go around that one. That's a tough one. Right? Here's the sticking point for many of us. God didn't give Hagar an explanation. He just said, this is what I want you to do. Hagar didn't have an explanation. She just had a directive. That's tough. Because sometimes we want an explanation of why, God, are you asking me to do this? And sometimes here's the reason why. That if God laid out all the things that you're going to do as he's calling you to do things, you're, it's going to scare you to death. And you're going to be doing things you didn't necessarily want to do. And you're going to go places you didn't necessarily think you were going to go. And, and God's going to show you just what you need to know as you're taking each next step. And that's what he's doing with Hagar in this moment. Sometimes God doesn't give us a full explanation. He simply gives us a directive. And directives sometimes don't make sense. There's a lot of things, right? Hey, let, me, let me just say it this way. Do you realize that there are a lot of things that we don't have to ask God's direction on? Those directives have already been given to us through the scriptures. I already gave a couple, like, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. You know, there's certain directives that are just, they're just there. Do it. And as a matter of fact, the brother of Jesus said this. Don't just listen to God's word. <laughs> You've got to do what it says. Otherwise... You're only fooling yourselves. When I rely upon God's trust and plan, when I trust his wisdom and not my own, he shows me what I need to do in the moment. He may not show me the entire plan. He's not going to show me everything, but he will show me what I need in the moment. And, and then it's up to me to take those steps. He doesn't push us. He invites us, right, to show us. That he's still in control. When my life doesn't make sense, we need to remember God's promises. We need to submit to his plan. And number three is this. We need to rest in God's presence. When dealing with circumstances that you didn't create, um, when the hurt is just kind of overwhelming in your life, when you're wrestling with a time in your life that's just, let's just admit it, sometimes it's just absolute misery that somebody else is putting you through. You're carrying the scars. Maybe some people don't even know about the scars that you're carrying. The weight is there. You simply have no idea how you're going to make it through one day after another. You're not sure you can make it any further. Here's what I know, that we can rest. We can rest in the presence of God. His presence is there. His peace is there. Genesis 16, 13, therefore, thereafter, excuse me, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. Catch this for just a second. She's coming out of Egypt. Egypt was full of God. They had so many. There were plural, plurality of gods that they worshiped. Here's the one time in her life that she sees a God who sees her. All these other guys that she'd been praying to, you know, they've never spoken to her before. They've never said, I see you. And in this story, we see a God who loves her and cares for her. And he says, I see you. And there's another point in this story where he says, I hear you. So she 
is in tune with a God who says, I see you and I hear you. And my friend, today, I want you to know that God sees you. He sees your pain. He knows where you're at. He hears the calls that you have for him. And in those moments, sometimes when it seems like God is not there, he's probably closer than he's ever been. In those moments when you think he's not there, he's probably the closest. God gave us this incredible promise. In John 15, 5, he said this. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What Jesus is saying there is this. You got to stay connected to me. You stay connected to me. When we stay connected, Jesus, when we're plugged into him, everything that I need, everything that you need is found in him. The peace, the protection, the pro provision that you need is found nowhere else than in Jesus. What overflows in that vine automatically flows through the branches if the branches are connected to the, the vine. If I pursue God, if I'm connected to God, he's there, he's with us. And what I know of God is this, that when I'm connected to the vine, in his presence, I find peace in the midst of chaos. In his presence, I find perspective that will overshadow any question that I might have. In his presence, I have the power to overcome any pressures, any expectations, and any responsibilities that God has given me. Isn't that good news? No matter what hurt you're feeling, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter how much it doesn't make sense in the moment, God can redeem all of it. And that's really good news. So, let's close. Let's wrap this up. I want to talk about this guy before we do. His name's Joseph. Anybody remember Joseph? He's got the pretty coat, right? Um, he, he looks a lot like Donny Osmond. Um, okay. If you know, you know. Um, Joseph had some brothers who hated him. And so they're going to kill him. However, what they decide is there were some nomads coming along, and they were like, hey, instead of killing him, let's sell him as a slave. How would you like to be in that household? Uh-huh. All right, so the brothers, they, they, instead of killing Joseph, they sell Joseph to some nomads that are coming by, and they sell him as a slave. And so Joseph, okay, he, he, he's sold to these desert nomads, and they take Joseph back to Egypt, okay? Now, there's some really peculiar things that happen in Joseph's life. And, and it's because God's working through his life, and he's able to interpret dreams and do some really crazy cool things. But Joseph goes from a slave to the number two in Egypt. And by number two, I mean right under Pharaoh, okay? He's like the second in charge. Now, here's the great thing. Joseph, being the second in charge in Egypt and being able to interpret dreams like he's able to do, actually saves many people's lives because he knew that there was a famine coming and was able to prepare for the famine. And he saves many, many Egyptian lives. But here's the funny thing. His family shows up in Egypt. Joseph's family shows up in Egypt Remember the ones who sold him into slavery? They show up to Egypt, and Joseph saves their lives too. That's pretty incredible. Why is this important? Joseph is a direct descendant of Isaac. Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. Okay, it goes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, than Joseph. He's a descendant of Isaac. Joseph saves his family lineage. Okay? Joseph saves his family lineage, 
And the only reason that he was able to save his family lineage is because some nomads from Egypt came and bought him out of slavery. Or bought him into slavery, actually. Now, do you know who came from the line of Joseph? Jesus Christ. Let me bring this back around for just a second, see if you can follow my, what I'm doing here. The band of nomads that bought Joseph from his brothers and put him into slavery, those nomads from Egypt were known as the Ishmaelites, the descendants of Ishmael, Hagar's son. Here's the point. The direct descendants of Ishmael, Hagar's son, Hagar had no idea her son and her, his descendants would play a direct part in the savior of the world. But they did. She had no idea that God would redeem her pain, that he would take something that did not make sense and he would somehow use it for his glory. But he did. And you and I, man, this is what I know, is that it doesn't matter the storms we're in, it doesn't matter the pains we're in, it doesn't matter the obstacles that we're in, it doesn't matter the turmoil that we're facing, I know this, that God knows exactly where we're at, and if we can submit to God, if we can be connected to him, I tell you, even when it doesn't make sense, we simply just don't know. But if we follow God and we remember his promises and we, and we lean into his plan and if we recognize his provision and we can rest in his presence, he will redeem it. Amen. Amen. I said all that this morning to just simply say this. This would have saved us a whole lot of time if I would have just went right to here. <laughs> Just because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean it's senseless. God can take your hurt, he can take your pain, he can take your misery, and in the grand scheme of things, his ultimate supreme purpose will be done. Amen. Because it brings glory to the Father. God, this morning... Help us to understand. Help us to understand that our purpose on this earth is to bring you glory, to bring you honor. What you've created us to be in this relationship we have with you is such a close bond that we can't help but receive your love and want to express your love to bring you honor, to bring you glory. And sometimes, God, you're going to ask us to do things that don't make sense. And we're going to go through things in life that don't make sense. And people are going to hurt us in ways that don't make sense. And sometimes, God, you're going to ask us to step into a direction that just doesn't make sense. God, help us to remember the promises that you've given. Help us to know that you have a plan. Help us to know that we can rest in your presence. Because when we do those things, Lord, ultimately your kingdom, your kingdom comes.